Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome along and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Sharon Dickey. I'm Chief Commercial Officer with Warracle. So delighted to be with you today. Hopefully um, we'll make it quite an informal session uh, and not too serious. We tend not to be and it's lead up to Christmas after all and I expect you're all getting excited about your Christmas nights in, um, such as we do them these days. So um, what we hope to do is just go through a few of our observations, what we've seen happen in the last year. Um, more probably staying away from labouring how tough it has been this year and that it's not a usual year. We all know that, you know, you and all of us have lived that together. Um, but what we're looking at is, I guess, in the big scheme of things, um, what's fundamentally changed how we work and what we're thinking in terms of what's coming ahead for particularly the tech industry um, and those type of clients that we work with. Um, going forward. Um, from a Warracle perspective, and Chris, and Chris can certainly talk about this later, is um, we've been pretty fortunate this year um, and we know a lot of uh, organisations and individuals haven't been. We're fortunate in the sector that we're in, we're fortunate with the types of customers that we work with, so um, please believe us that we're, we know that we're on the kind of luckier side of um, what's happened in the last year. Um, we do want to focus on positive outcomes um, in terms of where um, we as a tech company and individuals, how we've been involved in tech um, and how we see things going. And so what we'll do as we go through is we've got a few questions and topics to talk about, but we're interested to know what you want to hear from us, if hopefully something. Um, uh, so down in the bottom of the middle, you'll see that there is a Q&A section. Um, and you can ask away and ask any questions as we go forward. I'll try and gather them and fire them between us um, and try and moderate these two and, and see how we get on. Um, so let me to um, Chris Martin, who is our Oracle CEO. I'll let you talk in a minute, Chris, but I don't get often opportunity to introduce you the same sparkling way that you do me. So I will say that Chris is our inspirational, if somewhat unconventional leader. Um, who has been with, the, with us the whole time in terms of Oracle's growth and success, but not only with us, but with other leading companies. And um, we're never quite sure what Chris is going to say, um, but that's what makes things like this a great deal of fun. So before you talk, Chris, I'll introduce you to David Lowe, who's a longtime friend of ours and Oracle's um, with a dazzling career. Um, with just naming some of them of Skyscanner, Amazon, BBC, the list, to name but a few. Um, we couldn't be happier to be working with David and pleased that he's here today because if nothing else, Chris and I can bask in David's radiating glory and knowledge. So, um, so that's basically where we stay. See, setting you up for a fall already, David. Um, so... Uh, I will hand over to Chris and David to give a little bit of introduction about themselves um, and then we'll head into a few topics that we've got planned but please send in any questions depending on who's online I may or may not choose to answer them Tom um, but otherwise we'll just go from there so Chris can I hand to you and you can kind of reflect just in terms of an intro of yourself and what you think we can achieve today. Thanks Sharon I mean Yes, I'm sure you don't know what I'm going to say. And actually, I don't know what I'm going to say either, particularly when I'm, when I'm presenting. I actually find it really tough to think and speak at the same time. So often stuff just falls out of my mouth. So it's a surprise for me as well. Uh, I guess I'm a software engineer, a long time ago, tech guy. And for the last few years, I think I've been more in the commercial spreadsheet side, side of businesses. Uh, so I'm a bit rusty with the sort of deep tech. I can talk at a level. Uh, so I'm kind of, we're, we're playing on Mr. Lowe. <laughs> David, do you want to give us, I suspect there's quite a lot of people on this call who know who you are already, but um, give us a little bit of summary about you. Yep, that's quite the setup. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm the opposite way around to Chris, I guess. I started life as an accountant and spreadsheet person and then sort of self-taught my way into tech. Um, about 25 years ago and have just muddled my way through it ever since one way or the other. So um, I, as Sharon said, I've, I've worked for places that scaled up um, through tech, uh, whether it's um, 
finance or TV, media, newspapers, um, lately Sky Sky and Amazon be good fun but all i try and do is make things work and, and keep people happy that's that's the main thing um lately i've been at the list as sharon says which um this year in the world of live events has been a bit of a puzzle but we've come through it in one piece and hopefully left something there to grow next year so it's um, back to the spreadsheets but um certainly a learning curve this year on top of everything else brilliant so we'll get started you can see none of us are around a fireside but let's pretend that we are um, and rather than us ghost into a background, we'll just stay as we are. So to get us going, I'm going to start with something a little bit more tactical in terms of um, thinking. I've asked the guys, and I don't actually know if they've paid any attention to me, um, to think of two things um, from a work perspective and from your life as to two things that are fundamentally different that you've learned through the last year um, that you'll think you will take forward. Um, that has, I guess, a massive permanent change to things that we do. I'll kick you off from a work perspective. Um, and I guess what I'll add in and say is, actually, I'm okay with this medium. I quite like it. I quite like Hangouts. I quite like Teams. I do spend my enti entire day on it. But actually, for me, with our, my team's quite spread across the country, that actually it's been a great leveler for me and the team. Um, and I don't spend more time necessarily with one individual than the other. I don't get interrupted in the office. And so actually, um, for, for me, from a work perspective, this medium does work for me. So who wants to go next? Who wants to? Well, I, I held up my fire because I'm in the office, Sharon, and I'm sitting next to an oil-fired radiator because it's freezing in here. Uh, a, just a couple of things. I'll go if that's okay. Um, I made some notes because I'm not very good at thinking and speaking at the same time. And I, and I think I, I realized pretty early on that actually being good at remote working, both in a customer sense uh, and operating a business sense was actually really important because I didn't think we were going to get out of this anytime soon. So we made quite an investment in that, uh, you know, and some of our guys went off and they worked out how to do sort of proper sessions with customers. Uh, and, and I went on lots of webinars and tried to listen for ideas to steal from other people about how to run a business in this environment. And the truth is nobody really knew, but we've done lots and lots of experiments and some of them have worked and some of them have been absolutely hilarious. Uh, and, and I would say that Sharon's right. I mean, the company feels today more joined up than it used to be. Although we've not met a lot of people in person, at least I know what people look like and I can speak to them more frequently than, than I used to when I was having to travel around to see people. I think the thing for me is I've, I mean, I always, used to say that I was a miserable sort of introvert and I'd sit in the corner and tap away at my spreadsheets and get my head up every now and again and cause some nonsense and then go back to my spreadsheets. And I think I've realised that I like people more than, than I thought I did, you know, and, and, I, and that came about a month ago when I met a couple of people in the office. Because uh, I didn't, I got up in the morning and I was thinking, I knew I was going to the office and I wasn't excited about going to the office, but I thought oh, I'm going to the office. But then when I came home at three o'clock at night, I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> speaking to people and I'm sure the people that I spoke to just thought all I was like talking and I had all these ideas going around in my head and it was just like a release to get them all out there so I think you know, for me maybe I like people more than than I thought. <laughs> Phew. I was one of those people so hopefully includes me in that list. David. That's quite a takeaway quote. <laughs> I like people more than I thought. You put that on the office wall when you come back. Um, there's probably two things I, I can say about this. I mean, in the past, the BBC team I used to be part of um, deliberately did an experiment on this to see if they could work with less space. Um, so nothing to do with the pandemic, but about 18 months ago, we sent 140 people home uh, just to see what happened for two months. And um, being the public sector, it took a lot of, lot of buy-in to do that with um, sort of health and safety and and procurement and things we had to do but we learned an awful lot that I think um, certainly the BBC and then we went out and told people what we did um, some of the things Chris has talked about some things went very wrong you couldn't run a discovery session very easily you had to find a way around it and we got into things like a hundred people in a Miro board and all that kind of stuff and there's there's many things that are just rubbish um, and I think you, you do learn pretty quickly um, but secondly that this year I've worked with a really small team who work in an attic, who see each other's faces every day normally. And on Friday the 13th this year in March, they all got sent home with 
no laptops, no facilities, never done it before. And having to do that in the space of a weekend and keep a print publication running, which needs people looking over shoulders and stuff, it's hard, you know, and there, there are no easy ways around other than getting on with it. And I guess the first few weeks, I get a bit cynical about this. The first few weeks were quirky that I'll be late. I've got Joe Wicks at 9.30 or whatever it was. Things you could kind of put up with get a bit stale after a while and you start to organize your day. And I just think most of the people I know that have done this well and I've tried to do it have realized that our lives have changed, however temporarily, and you, you fit the work around your life as best you can because for months we had kids at home, quite likely to happen again. Um, and other people had knock-on effects, whether they had to isolate in a room for a week or whatever it might be. There, there's things we had to work around. So I think it's fitting work around your life, which companies might not have let you do, would be the takeaway. And the one thing that we probably shouldn't shy away from when this goes away. I think that, can I just say one thing on that? Because I remember very early in the, you know, we were, we were just as we realised this was going to be a thing for quite a long time. I remember making a speech in our, one of our company town hall meetings. And I said to some, you know, I said, like, I don't know how people are going to do this. We can't tell you how your working day will look like because you're going to have to work around all these different things, which are different from different people. And, and I, literally, I thought, how, how are people going to do this? But somehow we've all managed to do it. And it's absolutely, you know, I'm in awe of people that have juggled incredible difficulties and managed to do their work. And it's just been tremendous in, in a way, I suppose. There's an interesting yeah, I love that. I think there's quite a human nature that's come into work as well with all those things is that, you know, it's not just a BBC um, news with a guy with children walking in the back. It's, it's all the time now or a dog or a cat or a doorbell or things like that. And it's made work, I think, a little bit more human and a bit more informal, which I don't think is any particularly bad thing, particularly in our industry. It may not work for everyone, but um, definitely for us. So then from that, in terms of how you live, um, I'm looking for if it's any different, but the one thing that I'll kick us off with, and um, for those of you that know me, I've had a, quite a long industry in tech, um, particularly in self-service. And so my entire, a big part of my career has been about the importance of cash. And I appreciate I'm late to the party with regards to this game, but keep in mind that I've got children and I've done a lot of fundraising in the past is cash is gone from my life to the extent that this morning when the children went off to sparkle day i had no coins to give them for the donation because i have no cash um, and that is you know for many of you sitting on the call you'll be going what's the big deal that is such a huge change every year that i worked for the company i worked for ncr which is large self-service you know it's from atms point of sale self-checkouts every single year a consultant would come in and say cash will be gone within the next 10 years and every year and never happened never happened never happened um and actually this year there has been a significant decrease um by everyone with regards to the um, cleanliness of it, whether you need it, whether people want to handle it, and obviously the ability to do it in other, those transact in other ways. So that's a big change for my life. So who wants to take their next step? Well, I mean, I, I agree, but not in every country though, because I understand that some countries haven't been as badly affected. And I heard anecdotally that one of the first things that happened in Russia was people went to the cash machines and took out wads and wads of cash because they didn't trust the bank so uh, but certainly in this country i don't think for six months i had any cash at all um so it's it's going to make a massive change i, I think you know and uh, and actually i had to go and get some cash a couple of weeks ago to pay my architect who wanted paid in cash for a wee job that he did me i had to go into the bank and it was horrific you know to the bank branch to stand too close to people. And it was quite scary, actually, to put my hands on cash. So I think in this country, cash's days are in decline. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you think, though, in terms of your, how you live your life, other than the work side of things, mm -hmm. um, that's dramatically changed in this year? Um, or David, if you want to pick it up. I mean, I, what I was going to say is, I mean, I. I Again, there's things you realise about yourself, and, and, and I didn't realise that I quite liked travelling around and going to Edinburgh and going to Glasgow and going to London. I always viewed it as a bit of a 
pain in the ass. Uh, but now I miss that, you know, and I miss, I guess my life has become much smaller uh, than, it, than it used to be. And I look forward to getting out and about a bit and, and having, trying to work on my newfound sociability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've kind of gone the opposite way. I mean, I used to fly six times a week at one point and not by choice. Um, the thing I miss is not being able to travel by choice. Could do with that coming back, but I, I don't miss being forced to be in five cities a week or something like that, or um, three hours a day on a train. I, I live in Perth and the train service to Edinburgh is horrific. So that's three hours a day gone and that there's things you can do, but it's not perfect. So getting that three hours back, I just made a bit of a conscious choice to use the time properly and lost weight because it, it, this isn't the year to be a fat person with blood pressure in your late forties. So um, I th thought I'd make a virtue of some of this extra time back. So weight off, but even then, like I say, working the day around, um, having a bit of control back. I think that to me is the theme that people will realize they've been given control of things that they didn't realize they could get, whether it's your kid's education, because you can see in Google Classroom what they're up to and the kids can't hide the homework book like I used to do and stuff like that. And control of your, your health, because um, you, people are gonna have to be a bit more self-reliant in their health than they were, because I think people have realized this year that healthcare will always be rationed in some fashion, it just has to be. Um, and that's been never more stark. So there's an awful lot of things people will have to realize a bit more self-care um that than they have done on on cash my mum on i think the the day before lockdown went to the bank and another bank with a different account and took out about 500 quid it's still in her house to this day because she didn't realize she couldn't go anywhere to spend it and had to get her shopping delivered and learned how online banking worked and stuff like that so um despite thinking she would need to get things delivered to the door with cash she didn't and actually learned aged 80 quite quite quickly how to do the digital stuff she didn't trust before so there's a little transformation I'd, I'd rather she put the cash back now it's sitting in the house doing nothing but but people got used to these things pretty quickly yeah I think that's a really interesting one it kind of perhaps leads me on to the next topic that I think we can talk about and remember anyone if you want to ask us any questions just drop it in the Q&A box at the bottom um, but I think one of the things around that David is around how we think customer service is going to adapt and evolve out of this and, and what changes we think we'll have. So we've talked a little bit about cash and, and even for those out there that don't use it today or haven't used it for, for years, it's a fundamental change in terms of how the banking system and the economy works if so much of that comes out. Still moving around, transactions are still happening, but in quite a different way. And I think your mother's example is really interesting in terms of that's often been an argument of why we can't digitize an offering is because there's a segment of the population that can't, won't, whatever, um, isn't, isn't accessible in terms of using uh, that type of technology. So I'm interested to know what your thoughts are, everyone's thoughts are in terms of how you think self-service, uh, sorry, customer service is going to evolve um, into the next year. Who wants to start? I'll go first if you want. Yep. Um, it's something I've, I've thought about for years that, that there's, there's an industry that's ripe for automation. It's, it's customer service because it's fairly repetitive. It's high percentage repetitive and there are many things that humans shouldn't need to do. And it's not to do away with jobs at the end of the day because there's always going to be tech that runs these things and the jobs move sideways and I'm sure we might get on to that in other fashion later on but um, things like contact centers this year have had a bit of a culture shock that people have had to go home so anybody who was based in a, a farm of phones with booths and stuff had to do something different because it wasn't allowed um, and having to to adjust for that and then people not being there because they were sick or isolating or whatever it might be or the tech didn't work um, companies that weren't ready for that have to pivot pretty quickly but the way around it is to front load some of the work and take it away from the call center in the first place so there's a whole thing about service journeys that not enough companies think about that you can actually defend yourself against customer service by doing things well in the first place so I'm willing to bet many banks not to pick on anyone but banks would benefit from thinking about when you press a button in an app 
what the net effect of that might be 10 steps later if somebody complains about something and how to then attribute the customer service trip all the way back to what the person did even if it's onboarding for something that you haven't quite got right misunderstood and then six months later you then get the, the net effect of somebody complaining asking what whatever it might be um i think that journey is broken but and it's only going to be fixed at the front end and if you get that right there's less need for the service and the service can then become proactive because you learn about what people do and react to it um favorite example of mine has always been monzo just to pick out one that i know about but they have a function where they check um how many people got their pin number wrong whether they tell monzo about it or not they keep track of that number on a customer basis and based on certain triggers they will automatically offer you a pin re request by notification um to just in case and that defends them against an awful lot of people saying i need to change my pin a month later when they get it wrong the second time which is what causes calls so that that whole experience has um a lot to get right and it's very early there's some early cost companies like monza who to who use tech to try and defend themselves against scaling costs but i think there's better reasons to do it and this year's brought it into focus pretty sharply yeah i can't remember if it was you and i that were talking about this david but i follow monzo on twitter just to see how they're marketing and what they go out with and probably once a week at the moment they've got questions that go out that are really quite clever in terms of soliciting exactly that of what problems are to come so the one that came up last week was um, tell us in a sentence that you're a monzo customer without mentioning that you're a monzo customer and so all of a sudden they got a whole lot of commentary about what customers like and it makes them different in terms of being a monzo customer and then within it there were a few there were certainly a, a a smidgen of things that weren't going right but a really interesting way in terms of soliciting the feedback for extra features and functionality chris i can see you're keen to do you want to well, say something? pondering i mean i guess i agree with david that in some cases customer services handle in the failure demand that could have been done better digitally uh, and you know if, as i said i went to the bank for the first time i think i was in the bank for the first time for three years you know, it might have been, you know, and it was only because I couldn't do what I needed to do uh, automatically. And, and I spent a lot of time trying to work out what's going on here. And one of the things that I think people are afraid of now is touching public things, you know, the cash, cash machines and stuff. But they're also afraid of high density situations, you know. So I think town centres and stuff are going to be changed enormously. You know, people will want service not in the town centres. They're only going to town centres for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know it's, it's quite risky in people's heads so i think this period is going to have such a profound effect on the way people think and interact with businesses and, and the, you know there's some businesses which i think have radically changed which have massive knock-on effects like aviation has changed incredibly over the last year and that's going to have profound effects for for lots of sort of suppliers of those businesses and, and you know and the, the one that, that i keep looking at and keep coming back to because i think it's so central to how we live is how we move about, you know, transportation, cars, etc., like that. And that that industry is going through such a change this year and over the next five to ten years. That the knock-on effects of that, those things are absolutely enormous. Like I remember debating with a lawyer that they would be impacted about with uh, electric vehicles, and they're like, "Why?" And I said, "Well, you're going to get ride-hailing services, so you press a button to get a car to pick you up, and then at some point there might be self-driving cars, which arguably should be safety." safer and so that what that means is less people will own cars and that has an impact on the law, the law firm because i think 25 percent of legal firms at this moment in time their revenue comes from personal injuries following car accidents so it is, there's really sort of profound things going on in the world at the moment and it, as you said right at the start sharon it's been a tragic uh, you know tragic time in for some businesses and some people but it's, there's a lot of change and it's quite intriguing to sort of keep an eye on what's how that might shake up yeah i guess what i'm thinking from uh, i'll bring it into our world in terms of the mobile side of things is you know we're not shy in saying mobile is the imperative and it is the channel of choice going forward and i don't see that changing you'll see david romley sent this out the other week of that for the next decade mobile is going to be the channel of choice and i think what's interesting for me is I've worked in finance and IT for quite a long time now, financial services, 
is the importance either to get going on the journey because a huge amount of organizations have not um, and um, and this is even within the finance remit in terms of management and payments and insurance and 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 that kind of other parts that you think of think about other than <clears throat> the retail banks um, but it's even more important not to stall so I don't think you can put an app out and go ta-da and then not build upon it um, okay. because if, there's nothing worse than I think waiting someone's appetite and getting them ready to go and then if it's the start then it opens it up and then you go but can you tell me can you I'd like to know so I think from an invest the example I'll give is from an investments point of view of oh, fantastic I can see my balance okay, can I how does that change can I change I influence it, what happens, and I, I understand there's a big difference between guidance and advice, but I also think as well the importance in terms of continually testing and trying and doing the Monzo thing or, or you know, being a bit more agile in terms of the type of features and functionalities that keep the engagement going, that make the transaction easier, that make it you know, less clicks every time, whatever it happens to be, but just keep growing um, and in the wealth side of things, particularly you think in terms of surely, I know there are dangers, but equally the informing side of how you can grow people's understanding and, uh, and education. So I think that's a really interesting space from a, from a customer services point of view of you can't just start and stall on a mobile journey. You have to keep it going. And so your points about the call center, I think David are really interesting. We know, we saw at the start of COVID that many call centers were absolutely overloaded because all of a sudden anyone who wasn't on the alternative channels like mobile or web um, then overloaded the call centers whereas a lot of that feature functionality could absolutely be satisfied um, in a mobile I, environment. I mean, David and I have discussed this over the years and I think the weapon of first choice for people of a certain age you know or kids is mobile phone they'll always go to their mobile phone first to try and accomplish something right now uh, and, and I think you know you talked about it there Sharon people have this intuitive calculation thing that but what they're saying is how can I achieve this task the fastest what's the quickest medium to go and achieve this task I want to do my banking I'm not going to walk to my old PC fire it up wait five minutes for it to boot da, 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 da. and so they'll always go after the fastest way intuitively to accomplish and sometimes that's mobile sometimes that's voice you know there's interactions for example Alexa tell me the weather you know there's a three second command there but then there's a two minute sort of playback while it reads through the weather uh, and I think so I think people are very very attuned to deducing the best tool to achieve what they want the fastest and in most cases that's mobile yeah, I, I, the other example I reflect on quite regularly just in terms of my, my personal life is, you know, when I do a click and collect or a delivery for a, a supermarket, um, I'm constantly annoyed that I can do infinitely more on their website, though it is clunkier, but I can do more functionality. Um, the checkout's harder than I can on my mobile. So I can book many, I can book months in advance on the website, but I can't on the mobile. And yet the mobile interface and the mobile transactions are actually easier to run through, but there's things that they won't allow me to do. So I think there's, there's some really interesting things in terms of not only do we have a large segment in terms of moving, there's one of the questions Glenville's asked here is, do we think that there are verticals who um, have been very slow to dig digitize their businesses? Most definitely. Um, and do they need to accelerate in 2021? Well, personally, I don't think there's any question. There is it, to be in the game and to be competitive and offering the kind of service that you that your customers will expect. You have to move. You have to move towards mobile um, and as part of your channel experience. It's David, Chris, do you want to add anything? It's funny since Glenville mentioned that. Uh, comes from a travel background same as I have there is no more broken industry this year than aviation one way or the other <clears throat> whether it's just doomed because you can't travel or because it wasn't set up to cope with this kind of year in the first place and it absolutely wasn't so um, 
I had a holiday booked for going to Japan in April, which got cancelled on me. I, I could have chosen to go, but the flights got cancelled before I could make the choice. Um, didn't get the refund till October. Now, going through customer services to try and find out what was going on, even if it was just to say it'll be another six months, you could just about accept that as long as they were okay to tell you. But every time you got through, you had to sit in the queue, you had to wait to speak to a human, even if it's by chat, you could tell you were speaking to a human. Um, and just to be told, we don't know, try again in a week. And there's nothing more frustrating than that. The entire travel industry is built on that premise that they shouldn't have to, to do these things. So I think there's something right for fixing there once it all comes back again, because people won't put up with that. Um, but certainly, to Chris's point, I, I think mobile is the the most likely, but I think context is the imperative that you try and deal with people where they want to, to do something. And Chris illustrated, there, there are one or two early things in voice that are just easier to do because you're passing and it, you don't want to go and look up a weather app necessarily if you're just leaving to, put, to pick up a brolly or put a coat on or something. There are easier ways to get simple things. Um, the thing that's not quite happened yet is making it easy to find more important things. So it's still not easy in this country or in Europe to ask, a voice service for your bank balance because of privacy and other things and regulation that needs to be fixed but um, context is a thing that's important and mobile just happens to deliver quite a lot of context given where you are and the things you do on it but I think that's a better way to think about it. So in terms of your experience um, in voice you know, there's been a lot of conversations that this would be the year of voice I suspect they've said that for quite a long time but they did say it again about 2020. I haven't quite seen evidence to support that and that may be to do a lot of about what you've just talked about about David of there's still limitations in terms of how far you can take it and how far you can um, chain the transactions if you like or connect the trans transactions throughout the channels. Do you have any thoughts on you know what, whether it has made leaps and bounds or still yet to come? I think you're seeing it coming in phases. Um, I'll give Chris credit here coming up three years, I think it was, Chris came up with a formula to predict whether something was likely to work. That I've referenced many times in these chats we've had. Um, and it should be no surprise, and it shouldn't have been back then either, that um, a speaker is more likely to be used for music and audio than, than another type of device, especially when it's relatively easy to catalogue a set of artists and songs compared to many other things you might do. You know, it's, it's, it's a domain you can you can figure out. So it's no surprise that the things that work on voice services and are still successful are radio music and sleep alarms or sleep timers and that kind of thing. I think something like 15 of the top 20 voice services are sleep sounds and relaxation sounds to this day. And I think I used that fact three years ago. It's still the case. Um, things will change. The industry is starting to realize that there will be no assistant that wins everything. Um, it's just not possible this early. So to be able to ask a, a Google or an Echo, every time I say Alexa, something happens in the background, an, an Echo, um, there's, no, there's not any time soon going to be one assistant that rules them all. Um, if anything, there's going to be an ecosystem of domains that understand their speciality um, because you can train that better yourself. So thinking about customer service, it would be easier for the travel industry to build a domain specific assistant that can be referenced by the other ones and then you you might end up with 10 to 15 globally that specialize in particular things i think that's more likely um, there's things that haven't really been spoken about in the voice industry but it's entirely possible next year you'll be able to say to an echo or another compatible device a, a wake word that isn't amazon so you'll be able to say um B play radio one hopefully on an echo and then that starts to bypass the tech companies and give more direct access to the user which is all re customers really want in the first place um, and then things start to get easier because the regulation problem is having the tech company in the middle so once you've bypassed that a bank could build a service and as long as they're speaking directly to their customer the privacy and regulation stuff is much easier as well. So I think you'll see a step change next year when that starts to unfold that makes a lot of these things we've talked about a lot easier to do. I think I remember we had this conversation some time ago, David, that, you know, a mobile phone or an iPad, you know, the sort of primary interaction there is by touch and vision. 
you know, with a, a voice device, it's by spoken word and then listening. And that, you know, we were talking about that, it, you know, it, as you said, context really, really important. And sometimes uh, it's just much faster by touch and vision. And, you know, to sit and listen while somebody tells you something for two minutes, you know, you don't have the, the patience, or I don't anyway, uh, to do that. So I think, you know, it is part of an omni-channel context sensitive just ecosystem really and and the, the one thing i keep wondering about is when there'll be better federation between these sort of islands of, of voice devices you know like I'm an apple and uh, amazon can play nicely together and, and so on and i suspect that might come down the line as well well that's the thing that there's a thing in the background called the voice interoperability initiative which is quite a mouthful but that's exactly what it's designed to do so um Amazon, Apple and Google are all on board because ultimately they use much of the same firmware underneath or hardware. So most, most speakers use Qualcomm, whatever brand they use, and, and Qualcomm can handle 64 wake words on a device and all that stuff that it's not been unlocked until the tech companies agreed to play along, but that's coming. So they've been working on that for about a year in the background. So next year it starts to get interesting. And the, the, the thing there will be, if you've been working with um, Amazon, for example, um, but you want to make your own assistant, there are bits of technology that let you build an assistant on your own now, which is how the BBC did it. You can buy a lot of it off the shelf. Mm. Um, will they willingly, as a tech company, hand off to another assistant if the other assistant's better placed to answer? So if you're used to saying something trivial like um, Amazon Play Radio 1, for example, will Amazon let that go? Because ultimately they've passed the user off. Now, they still own the device, but would they give the relationship for that request off to another assistant? That's all to unfold. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'd be surprised if that was allowed overnight, unless it becomes a user preference that you opt into. Okay. Okay. That's cool. So one of the things that we were going to talk about as well was there's quite a few questions coming in. So I'll try and read as we go, but um, we were talking just then about privacy and I just wonder over the next over the next period based on what we've been through and we've seen adoption and we've seen um you know a lot of organizations move forward probably a good number of years in terms of their own strategy um where we think we're headed with regards to the trade-off between privacy and adoption when does convenience take over in terms of convenience over privacy um any thoughts in terms of where we're headed with that while I read some things. That's not really something I give a lot of time thinking about, but I think I understand the question. And, you know, convenience is certainly won over the last few years. You know, it's been convenience and privacy second. I think privacy is certainly, privacy and security is certainly, certainly, you know, going up, up the agenda and possibly equal, maybe not quite yet equal, but certainly much, much closer in people's implicit desires, I think. I think, again, from the sort of conversational world, that's a good example, but much of the work in the last two years, and if you look at Google's announcements in particular, is forcing the tech to work on the device rather than go up to something else. Um, and to most users, they won't notice, but um, if the tech is able to handle a request there and then without having to pass off to a cloud service or even be connected, more importantly, uh, that is starting to happen. It's all about miniaturization of tech and how, what you can actually fit into a chip or or a, a, a piece of memory. That, that's starting to be a thing. Um, Apple are probably leading the way on it that they claim your health stuff is only ever done on the device aggregated and then passed on as anonymized chunks to, to learn from it. And, and you don't give away your private health data to somebody else. But um, it's not going to go away. And there's always going to be a trade-off between people uh, wanting useful things but not being willing to put in the, the cost. And I think that's a trade-off that's going to take a few years. Blair and I had a discussion about this on the last webinar and we were talking about perhaps a younger generation than us um, and their willingness to give away privacy. And I know we've been around long enough to know that we talk about in, in time you'll sell your data and it will be valuable and you know that's not really come to pass so far. But what's interesting in terms of perhaps a younger generation who's quite willing to sign up to various games and social platforms and give them information in terms of how quickly that dynamic could change with, with regards to privacy versus 
convenience or adoption or whatever it gets them in terms of um, I don't know, gratification might be the wrong word, but in terms of moving through uh, levels or whatever it happens to be. So I think there's always generational aspects that come into adoption of technology, but I do think quite an interesting one in terms of where they take privacy and also how you try and teach them about privacy and the importance of privacy as well. I think there's an interesting, sorry Chris, you go first. Probably. I mean, I, I say I'm not an expert in this, but you know, I do observe that kids are more likely to be naturally trusting and, and overlook privacy. Uh, and you know, I think it's, a, it's an interesting domain and something we all need to do better at privacy and security, you know, because it's, it's becoming a bigger problem. I was just going to throw in a funny example, but it's all tied back to the cash problem. Um, at some point, the, the dark economy that lives on cash is going to have to adjust to, to living in tech, and it may not be to their benefit. But I have a friend who, um, I better not say who it is, but he bought some drugs with Bitcoin about four years ago, and he got a decimal point the wrong way. He'd spent 10 times more on them than he, than he intended to. But it just shows he's doing something willingly that is traceable up to a point where it wouldn't have been before other than CCTV or something. So there's a whole adjustment in, in life that this is going to unlock that I'm not quite sure how that's going to go. And my son signed me up to something the other day on his Xbox and it, it tied my Microsoft account to something I've never heard of and I wasn't too comfortable, comfortable about it. But yeah. I think that's going to become much more of a problem. All my team know that I talk proudly about being um, sober from Facebook for probably up to three or four months now. Um, and that's part of my reticence of being wanting to be involved in that platform anymore. But I, I think it's interesting conversations there. One of the questions we've had in is taxi services such as Uber, food delivery such as Del Deliveroo, hotels, Airbnb, just a few industries that have been disrupted by mobile over the past 10 years. What industry is right next for dis disruption by mobile? And Chris and I will say the same thing. So we'll go with you, David, first. <laughs> There's a good example I saw last week, which doesn't really answer your question, but um, somebody worked the calculations out whether drones would be cheaper than people on bikes with a company like Delivery. So in Ireland, there's a company doing drone food delivery to the window. And they worked out it's actually cheaper, given the cost of maintaining roads and all that, cheaper to both the, the company and society to, to have drone delivery. And, and apparently it's going to be a thing. It's operating in a village in Ireland right now and ready to roll out everywhere. So I think um, self-driving food delivery and stuff is probably right for disruption, even though it's only just got going. Yeah, I mean, that's a tough, very tough question to answer, because the answer is most, if not all. Will, but I mean, there are things that I think are going, undergoing really rapid periods of of change and mobility and delivery, you know, are in there. They're the ones that I'm kind of interested in. You know, I bought my first electric bike and I have an app for that and I was farting around with the bike and, you know, trying to make it work differently. And, and you know, and a bike, you know, electric bike's a replacement for a car. It's not really a replacement for your pedal bike. Uh, so that I just think there's really profound changes going on in the world accelerated by COVID. And actually, I remember writing a blog article, it wasn't a blog article, it was a Facebook post in, in January. And I actually looked back at it and I said, here's the, here's the things that will be bigger in the 20s and here's the things that will be smaller. You know, it's all the things you'd imagine, you know, like cardboard's going to be huge in the 20s because of deliveries and all this sort of stuff. And then, you know, fast forward three or four months in COVID, and I, and I, I couldn't quite answer this question myself. I thought all COVID really has done has accelerate really, really quickly things that were underway anyway. And it's basically pushed the work world forward in many respects, five or 10 years. Uh, and, you know, so I think there's lots and lots of things that are really moving really quickly and you know, innovation is rich. A couple of that I would say in that part is one being the industry, I think legal is one that is oh. very, I don't get Chris don't, started. Don't get me started. Very traditional, still needs to see the whites of your eyes, still needs to have face-to-face -face conversations, still needs ink signatures. Um, and I think that one's just you know, whether it chooses to move or not, but is very slow with regards to, I'm generalizing, but I think it's a fairly safe generalization in this case. You know, I'm sure you know, but I had a huge spat with a bunch of lawyers. I was selling a flat, I needed a wet signature. I had to go and ask my next door neighbor who's elderly to sign a bit of paper I'd touched. 
So I'm complaining to the legal firm, like, why are you actually jeopardizing the health of my neighbor to get a signature? You know, this is 2020, it's not 1800, you know, and oh, I mean, it's just scandalous how slowly some industries have. I think the other one that's quite interesting is education. Um, and I don't just mean schools, I mean universities as well, in terms of, yes, they've moved to Zoom classrooms, but have they moved much of the learning to a tablet or to mobile or some kind of digitization? They, we have delayed exams, but are exams modern? You know, uh, exams the way that we should move forward? Or is there a different way in terms of they, that they could operate? And the only reason I bring that one up is because of the point that David mentioned at the start is we're all much more aware now of how our children learn and what they learn or, or potentially what they're going to have to do in January if we all get locked down again. Um, so I think that's, for me, a sector of the market that has a lot to learn. And I often joke that when, so I have a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old, my 10-year-old boy, when they started doing their hangouts with the classroom using Teams, um, that what they didn't appreciate was 10 year old boys would spend the entire time writing funny chat jokes while the teacher was trying to talk or kick the teacher out or meet the teacher or play games like that and so there's a whole way of how children use these devices that um, i guess hadn't been planned in terms of the design of the devices so it's an interesting one i think that what could be achieved in that space you know, do you know what somebody pointed out to me and i thought it was an absolutely jaw-dropping idea you know, this is probably in about May when the, you know, the schools were all over the place. They weren't able to make the technology work. And, and they said, well, what they should have done is got a bunch of teacher training students who were young students, you know, and attached them to a school who would come with all kinds of, you know, they'd be much better at working technology. They'd be able to coach the teachers. Here's how to do it. Here's some new ideas. And then, because I think one of the huge issues, at the, you know, before the summer was the teachers themselves were scared of the technology. You know, and actually all it would have taken is getting some teacher training kids to go in there and say, well, you can do this, you can do that. And it would have layered and layered on really, really good innovation. And it would have been a totally different experience for the kids, I think. So I think we... as well, you look at the experience the university students are getting. Hmm. Um, it's certainly not the typical university experience. Um, and so you kind of have to feel for them despite you know, all of their COVID parties and the likes. Um, so I do think it, there's interesting things that I think could be achieved and modernised in there. I think there's, there's a realm of things this year that have been exposed about, we, we're all being told to assess our personal risk. You know, we've got different tiers of, of uh, restrictions and things like that. And we're all being told to, to think carefully about what we do. But the, the, the data that we're being fed and processed is substandard. So it's really hard until very recently. It was impossible in March, but it's, it's still quite difficult to do now to know if you should be going out to the supermarket in your neighbourhood or, or that kind of thing. I mean, where, where I live, we're sort of caught between Tesco and a prison and the prison officers shop in Tesco at lunchtime and they had a massive outbreak. So do we avoid it or not? It's little things like that that people yeah. were thinking about, but, but you're not informed. Um, so I'm not sure how you're supposed to make that kind of decision yourself. It's interesting because I heard the lady, I think Susan Mitchie, I think, talking on Radio 4 one morning, and she was talking about, you have a pair and it, you know, straight, straight away it seemed to me that actually that's my fitness pal for risk, you know, and it could be taking fed, feeds from proper data that's saying this area is more risky than that. And, you know, and what you did during the day is I'm planning to go to the shops, I'm going to see my gran, I'm going to do this, and it would work out your risk points and would say, you're over point, mate, yep. you need to wind your neck in a little bit. And, and I think you just, it's basically decision support, isn't it? I mean, you've got an app that best part of 2 million people in Scotland downloaded, which tells you if you were near somebody that's yep. been infected. And it's not perfect, but there's so much more you could do with that. But again, it probably gets lost in the whole privacy angle that the government doesn't want to get involved in looking like it's following you yep. or telling you what to do more, more pertinently. So I think there's some gaps there that the data's there. Um, it's not been open enough, it's not been published well enough, it's getting there, but it shouldn't have taken nine, 10 months. Um, and you can apply that sort of level of risk, as, as Chris says, to just about anything. So if you're, if you're more into wearables than mobile, then there are things that can be tracked and that's, that's only gonna get deeper if you opt into it. So again, I, we spoke about this a few weeks ago, but um, I had a period of the year I felt really grim, but it turned out my watch was telling me I was low on oxygen. 
So I, I don't know because I wasn't tested, but there's every chance I had COVID or something like it. Um, but it was being tracked in the background. You can look back and see the lull for about two weeks that took a while to get over. So if I'd known that at the time, I may have done something about it. But that, that's that's right for improvement. It must be. It's, it's interesting. Sorry for wobbling on about this, Sharon, but I remember, you know, as people may know, we do a lot of work in healthcare and wearables or more mobile. What it, what it does is it could, can quite in, invasively, is probably the wrong word, but quite exhaustively know things about your life, but in a non-threatening way. Uh, you know, and the, the one example that I, I went to Boots to get my eyes tested for the first time as a, as a newly middle-aged guy. And I went in the machines, you know, and flashing lights and all this stuff and I'm thinking shit I'm go they're going to find out I've got diabetes or cancer or something and uh, you know and, and then it suddenly dawned on me I thought well why doesn't my Alexa uh, sorry my, not my Alexa my uh, Amazon Kindle app give me an eye test whilst I'm reading you know because it knows my focal length it knows my text size you know and and I thought it could be giving me you know what I would call a passive eye test that at the age of whatever it is said hey mate you need to go and get your eyes tested we think your your eyes are reach that you can't you know you need to hold your phone too far away from your face stage and I think there's lots of things like that David where do the good job for you you know beavering away in the background and telling you that you've gone out of whack at something Aye. and that, that everybody would sign up to that as long as you trusted that Amazon wouldn't try and sell you specs yeah Right, I'm going to jump into a couple of other questions because we've only got eight minutes left um, so there was a question around um, agile teams um, and have we found it more difficult to run the teams given that we're not huddled around a whiteboard with post-it notes and potentially far flung around the country, let alone around the world? Um, so who wants to have a shot at that first? Uh, I can give a view from Oracle, but Chris, do you want to? I, I can't speak for the developer teams. You know, I've heard anecdotally that they're getting on fine. It's maybe not quite as much fun uh, you know, when you get together in a room and you can riff and, and have a bit of a laugh and stuff. It's just a bit more high friction doing that kind of interaction digitally, I, I would assume. I, I would say that in the sort of non-technical teams, which effectively follow a lot of the same disciplines uh, anyway, it's been fine. You know, it's been okay. I mean, the, the meetings change. You know, if, you know, if you go in an hour meeting, then generally what I find is the first 15 minutes is nonsense. You know, and really what people are, I think what people are saying is, I need to feel good, you know, I need to feel good and then we'll do the work kind of thing. So I, I, I think it's changed, but it's not, it's not terrible. Yeah. David, do you have any comments? Um, nothing from this year specifically, but, but the, the trial we did at BBC last year, sending everybody out, one of the first things we had to get over was keeping people honest because you can't be next to them. So if you can't see their whiteboard, if that's what they do. I'm not saying they were dishonest, it's, it's kind of the opposite point, but um, if you have regular reviews, it's, it's difficult to keep people um, on track and make sure they're doing what they say they are. Because every week you tend to get the same central review story, but you can't do the four o'clock walk to the desk to see what's actually going on. So you end up building a level of trust over time, but it's not easy to do. I think that's one of the lessons this year, you can't see people all the time. So you do have to trust and build a way to trust what they're doing that is probably new to a lot of people. And not everybody likes having whiteboards and post-its and stuff. A lot of people have probably quite enjoyed this year and having a bit of peace away from that stuff, but it needs the trust to be able to, to get on and do things as well. See, I'll go back to what I said at the start of this, this works for me and it's okay. You need to work at it. Um, I think our teams in the main have done fine, um, but we're pretty embedded in terms of a lot of people were remote anyway, on and off and temporarily. So it was just a slight reorganization for us compared to what it would have been for many different places. I think you do have to work harder um, and you have to integrate the more social element into it as well. So, you know, I joke about things of that when you wear stage makeup, it has to be bold in order to be seen. And I think in this environment, you have to be bolder or funnier or a bit more gregarious in order to make sure that you're doing that thing of, is David okay? Is Chris okay? Is everyone, you know, that you're seeing in this environment, is everyone okay as well as that? We also have been involved with um, a, a psychologist a little bit throughout this just to understand the trends and what's going on and, you know, the importance of, I guess, good leadership um, and um, managing performance 
not time. So it went back to what Chris was talking about or whoever said at the start in terms of um, that you work when you can fit the work in. And so long as the performance is delivering, then the nine to five goes away. Um, and so I think that's kind of one of the biggest differences that we've certainly had to deal with. We have four minutes left. So a couple of topics, I'll just see if there's any others down the bottom that we're going to get through. One of the topics that we were gonna talk about, which is interesting for us, and I know many tech industries is the, as a whole are doing okay in the scheme of these things and, and, and the demand is quite high. Um, and what we're gonna talk a little about is Chris's favorite um, of um, skills. Um, and the skills that we find within the UK shores in terms of um, are there gaps? What kind of gaps are they um, in terms of the types of technologies? And uh, how do we see, you know, do we see that growing in terms of more or different types of technology that we need um, as a private business, we need to be able to source um, in the community. So, I'll give you one minute, go. You're going to get my rage coming out here. And, uh, you know, I was, I, was, I was up till nine o'clock, not up till, I was working till nine o'clock at night, firing out emails, raging about people about, you know, lack of skills in this country. So it's something that I feel really keen about. I mean, essentially, we need more designers. We need more software engineers. Uh, we need more women in technology. And actually, I mean, the thing that bothers me, given that I was a bit of a, you know, a naughty boy when I was younger, uh, is... Tech is a great home for people that may not succeed in other more conventional industries. You called me unconventional at the start, Sharon. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, this thing that I, now I understand it's got a posh term called neurodiversity, you know, people that think differently and are a bit different to the norm. Uh, and so I really bother about those things. I bother about women, I bother, bother about this neurodiversity. And I really bother that in Scotland, in you know, Scotland or England, there just isn't enough software engineers, and I just don't think we're doing a good enough job there. We should stop on there, David, because he will go on for a long. That's very reserved. So, David, do you have any comments to? No, I'd echo all of that. I, mean, I know that Scotland's been planning a lot of things this year, and, and I know Mark Logan's report tries to address a lot of it for the long term. Um, the funding for it appears to be quite skinny at the minute, so we'll see how that actually turns out. The funding that the numbers have been talked about would fund a lease for one place like Codebase for a, a year or two and not much else. So I think it needs a lot more support than it's actually had so far. So look forward to that. Yeah, um, I, my tuppence worth on this is I think most definitely, um, certainly some of our um, academic organizations need to look closer at, uh, at employability in terms of what streams that they head people down. Um, so, you know, whilst there is good uh, research funding in certain cool areas of tech, there's really good living to be made um, and really interesting projects if uh, more people followed, say, for example, the general software um, path and then got in, and then, of course, updated the technology in terms of mobile, in terms of AI, MR, anything like that, in terms of actually being more usable um, in the employability side. And then my, my other bandwagon is, is we need to look better at the inclusivity and diversity side of it um, across the board, because we have unconscious biases as in terms of who fits in our industry and who doesn't fit. And actually, um, I think this industry is more open than most, but could be even more so. Um, in terms of uh, how we approached and attracted people into the industry. We have one minute to go. So I don't know if you've got any last thoughts before I wrap up, before everyone drops off and races off to their Christmas parties. One of the things I love about software is it's so diverse. You know, there's so many, it's quite very liberal, you know, and there's all sorts of people who make you laugh your head off and sometimes drive you nuts, you know, and, and I think it's such a, great place to work and I just want more people to want to come into it and, and add to that rich chaos. I think that's right. <clears throat> Almost the opposite point that as tech grows, the things that you call text 
start to change. So I know people that say they work in tech, but they're actually accountants, lawyers, but for the tech makes them work a bit differently. I know we went through a lot of that at Skyscanner that even the accountants ended up having hack days to make the banking process work better and the, the company got the best of it. So I think the more uh, the industry grows, the more benefit everybody will get in the end. Um, and it's, it's all coming. Okay, so thank you very much, David and Chris. I hope it's been half interesting for people that have been listening. Um, uh, I know we could have covered so many more topics. We had pages upon pages of stuff and I know the team will be sitting behind us going, why didn't they mention this? Um, so apologize to our team for, for everything that we didn't say. Um, all I would be left to say is, um, you know, we're heading, hopefully most of us are heading into a break. I hope most of you get a good break away. Um, we would like to wish you and yours a very safe and Merry Christmas. Um, and look forward to working with you and doing more meetups and webinars with you in 2021. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.